traditional sedan is fading fast as crossovers and SUVs dominate the market. However, some brands remain dedicated to keeping sedans alive, and Audi is leading this charge. During a recent visit to Nice, France, CarBuzz had the opportunity to test the new Audi S5 sedan, its European moniker, at its global media launch. The model is expected to arrive in the US late next year. This launch is significant for two main reasons. Firstly, it's one of Audi's initial models to use the new premium platform combustion, PPC, architecture for combustion engines. Secondly, it marks the end of the combustion-powered Audi A4, which is set to transition to an electric vehicle in its next generation. Pros, bold design that distinguishes it from competitors. Excellent steering feedback. Improved handling without sacrificing ride comfort. Effective ADAS features for city driving. Spacious interior and trunk. Cons. Large body can create blind spots. Passenger infotainment screen feels unnecessary. Transmission limits throttle response. US market won't receive the Avant wagon body style. As Audi reorganizes its model naming, even numbers now signify EVs while odd numbers denote combustion engine models. Thus, despite its S5 name, Audi's team asserts it's a direct successor to the S4 and competes with the Mercedes and GC43 and BMW M340i. The sedan's design cleverly conceals a trunk lid that opens like the former S5 Sportback, providing an SUV-like cargo space with full flat rear seats. This S5 sedan merges the legacy of both the S4 sedan and S5 Sportback, though in the US, it will be simply called the S5 as the only available body style. This change also signals the eventual phase-out of the familiar S4. The new S5 is Audi's first model built on the PPC architecture, a refined version of the ML Vivo platform that incorporates a completely new electronic system shared with Audi and Porsche's latest electric models. The previous S5 Sportback was known for its practicality, but its sloped roofline often seemed awkward and hunched. The new S5, however, takes on a classic three-box sedan shape that looks more normal. A case where conventional design works best, in my opinion. It's a larger car overall, outgrowing its predecessors in almost every dimension. Yet balance proportions keep it from feeling bulky or unwieldy. Its design elements are well executed, featuring a long hood, a short rear, and bold touches like a prominent grille and distinct air curtains on the front bumper. The large 20-inch wheels on the Ascari Blue model I drove further enhance its proportionate look, making it feel compact yet cohesive. And happily, the exhausts are real. The S5's design is understated yet effective, with an appeal that's striking without any unnecessary flair. While it's not quite the minimalist statement of the first-gen S5, it's equally attractive. Two standout details catch the eye. First, Audi's OLED head and taillights have been upgraded with eight programmable designs, which could theoretically change on the go. However, due to US regulations, these designs only switch each time you start the car. Unfortunately, US laws also restrict features like the captivating, sparkling taillight effect or the automatic shift to brighter, solid taillights when another vehicle approaches rapidly from behind. The second highlight is the door handles, which are flush mounted with a capacitive release button inside. As the first tactile interaction with the car, they make a strong impression and feel fantastic. Interior, positively cavernous where it matters. Cabin space is a relative concept, dependent on the size of the person sitting inside. But for me, at 6 feet tall and a buck 80, there was more than enough room both in the front and rear seats for me to comfortably sit behind myself with knee and headroom to spare. The trunk is arguably where the practicality is at its best, though, as the Sportback style trunk means 15.7 cubic feet of space can transform into 45.9 cubic feet when you fold the rear seats. It's simply cavernous and a huge boon for the sedan segment, which often has its lack of practicality used against it by buyers trying to justify purchasing a crossover instead. Interior technology and infotainment. Forward thinking, but an opportunity missed. No new premium car can launch without the latest technology and a plethora of screens, including one for the front passenger. Audi pulls off the ladder better than most, 
with a 10.9 inch screen that integrates neatly into the design of the dash and can be switched off entirely or made to display a decorative pattern to avoid looking like an eyesore. The core screens are angled towards the driver. Audi emphasized the S5 being driver focused this time around, comprising an 11.9 inch instrumentation screen supported by the main infotainment's 14.5 inch touchscreen. The latest version of Audi's multimedia interface, MMI, has native app functionality so you can download Spotify, YouTube, and even games. My brief sojourn in NICE afforded me some time to play with these systems as both driver and co-pilot, revealing some pleasant points, but also a few areas of concern. The MMI system's UI is relatively intuitive and responds quickly to touch inputs, including pinch and swipe gestures. It also uses chat GPT and voice commands to let you control infotainment and climate settings, but it didn't like casual language and only responded when I used more rigid descriptive commands. Hey Audi, set the driver's climate control to 84 degrees. Instead of Hey Audi, turn the temperature up. Herein lies another flaw. Just give me physical buttons to control the climate. On more than one occasion, I had to take my eyes off the road to find a basic function on the 14.5 inch screen. It was both infuriating and dangerous. The passenger screen let me down somewhat, as it largely mirrors the primary MMI screen, but with limited functionality. You can pull up a display to control the massage seats. This screen shows the driver's seat, as well as the passenger's. But do you think I could set a massage routine for the driver? No. Likewise, I could connect my Android device via Bluetooth. Wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay come standard to the car, but there was no dedicated Android Auto display for the passenger screen through which I could use various apps. If the passenger screen is going to merely give me a watered-down version of the main screen's functions, then what's the point? The only element I did like was that when I opened up a YouTube video from the passenger side, my driving partner was unable to watch it. The screen appeared blank to her when a video was playing, although when navigating menus, she could clearly see everything I was doing. The Bang & Alusson premium sound system was also notable. Now featuring speakers in the headrest through which phone calls and navigation commands are played, it was initially disconcerting, but it quickly made sure I never missed a command when driving around a country unfamiliar to me. Expert opinion, I'd have liked more from the passenger screen. I already carry a screen around with me that has access to all my music, videos, social networks, and more, so if all the passenger screen will let me do is control the massage seats and navigation, then I struggle to see the point. Give me an in-car screen that mirrors the device in my pocket, and I'd be happy, but this felt limited and gimmicky, 